it's no secret It's plain to see everyone thanks for joining us we're actually just waiting for our author to arrive so give us a minute till we see her and we'll get started shortly
Hello. Okay, there you are. Hello. All right, I'm going to join you up on stage. Give me just a minute. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Give me just a minute. I'm going to join you on stage. Okay. Okay, there you are. Hello. Hi, Susan. Glad you made it. Thank you I know so much. Walking me through the process. <laughs> no problem. It's you know it's always tricky the first time, and once you get the hang of it, it's it's really simple and it's really wonderful to use. So let me just do one more thing, and all right, and then I'm going to invite everybody to join us. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, people will start trickling in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. So, hello, Firesiders, and welcome to Adventures by the Book, where our mission is to connect people and communities through the power of books. I'm your host, Susan Macbeth, and I'm delighted to be hosting today Elizabeth Naya Maioro to speak about her book, her memoir, I Am a Girl from Africa. Uh, beautiful cover. Um, welcome to all of you who are on our virtual audience, but also to those of you who are listening from our public profile page and also on any of our social media channels. And a special welcome to Elizabeth's publicist, Abigail, who I don't know if she's joined us yet, but uh, she'll be in the audience, which will, would be fun maybe to chat with her as well about the whole experience. Yes, there she is. Hi, Abigail. Welcome to the audience. Um, for those of you who are new to the uh, app, the Fireside app. It's really a great program that allows you to interact live with the author. So you can click on that little black button on the lower left-hand corner of your screen anytime, invite yourself up on the stage and chat live with Elizabeth have, if you have a comment or a question for her. Um, and we encourage you to do that. It is an interactive program and we do love that. Um, and then you can also react. Anything uh, resonates with you that Elizabeth talks about, you can react in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and you know, do a smiley face or hand clapping or hearts. And it, there's always accompanying uh, sound effects, which are kind of fun too. So with that being said, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome today's guest. Elizabeth Naya Maioro is an award-winning humanitarian and former United Nations Senior Advisor on Gender Equality. Born in Zimbabwe, Elizabeth has worked at the forefront of global development for over two decades, improving the lives of underserved populations, and she's held leadership roles at the World Bank, the World Health Organization, UN AIDS, and UN Women. You would think after reading, reading her bio, reading her book and all that she's accomplished, you'd think she was 80 years old because okay. it takes a lifetime to do what she has done in her short life. And it's very impressive. Uh, she's a political scientist by training. She holds a master's degree in politics from the London School of Economics and Political Science. I Am a Girl from Africa is her first book. Congratulations and welcome, Elizabeth. Susan, thank you so much for having me. I have a fun fact for you. Actually, this book was partly written in San Diego. So what? I ended up, yes, I ended up getting stuck there on my way to South Africa because of the pandemic. And I spent six months living in North Park and was in the midst of writing the book. So San Diego holds a very dear place to me. Oh my gosh, that's such a great story. Well, I hope you will come back someday and do a live in-person event with us. I would love that. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, Elizabeth, typically before we begin our events, I always like to talk to the author about their trajectory to where they are today, you know, starting back when you were a little girl and your exposure, but your book is a memoir and it starts with that. So we're really going to be talking about your whole book, um, which is really fascinating. It's inspirational. It's heartbreaking. It's touching. It's motivational. It's everything. Um, and I just, I just sensed before I even met you that you were just a ray of sunshine and, you know, this yellow cover and your yellow dress and your sunny personality, personality and your beautiful smile just already attest to that. So I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, let's start where the book starts, which is really very heartbreaking and tragic um, where you are a little eight year old, um, innocent little girl living in Zimbabwe who is literally starving to death. I mean, you were probably hours, if not days away from, from dying when an angel in blue comes your way. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, set, set the, the stage for what was going on, where, where you were, what was happening and what about this angel? 
Yes, yeah, so I grew up in a very small village in Zimbabwe and I was raised actually by my gogo, my grandmother. And what was remarkable with regards to my childhood is how we grew up really as part of a very tight knit community where we pretty much did everything together. We farmed together, we harvested together, we shared all our food with each other. And I remember as a child never wanting for anything. But then sadly, when I turned eight years old, a severe drought devastated our village and there was literally nothing to eat and nothing to drink. And one day I hadn't eaten for three days and I immediately collapsed onto the ground. I'd been, you know, I'd gone to the forest to try and find dried berries or anything that I could find to eat. My gogo was away uh, praying for uh, a sick, uh, one of the sick uncles in another village. And I collapsed on the ground and I literally thought that I was going to die because I remember going in and out of consciousness, right? And, and kind of everything going dark and, and light and dark and light. And then really an incredible miracle happened to me in that moment, this woman, this girl wearing a blue uniform found me and it turns out she was an aid worker with the United Nations. And what was even more special for me is that she was a fellow African girl from a different village, obviously. And she found me, she gave me a bottle of porridge and saved my life. And that for me was such a pivotal moment because I then realized once I knew that this woman worked for the UN, that this is exactly what I wanted to do with my life too, that I would find a way, no matter what it took to try and make a difference in the lives of others in a similar way that my life had been saved. And so in this moment of tragic actually became a gift to me it defined my life purpose and here I am today, you know, working at the United Nations. That's, yes, she deserves a round of applause, let me tell you. This, this is an amazing, remarkable story. But, you know, you were eight years old. I mean, literally, you were starving to death. I just can't get this picture out of my head. And instead of, like, kind of wallowing in self-pity and, you know, the tragic circumstances that you found yourself in, you use that as a, a calling to to not only help your community, but really save the world. I mean, one girl saving the world. I can think I can really safely say that about you after reading your memoir. <laughs> no, but I'm, I think that was also what's interesting. And I think for me, that's the big takeaway that sometimes we find ourselves facing some of the most difficult challenges. I think even right now, I think, you know, the past two years have been very difficult for everyone. And it can be very easy to wallow in that and really feel you know, demoralized and depressed about the situation as it should be, because it is hard. You know, we've had so much loss and human suffering because of the pandemic. But what I've also learned, and in particular, given this moment in my childhood, was that sometimes some of our greatest challenges also presents us with our greatest opportunities. And, you know, little did I know at the time that, you know, everything that was happening to me were actually was happening for me rather than against me. Because now I work at the United Nations, I am working to address global hunger, and I know exactly what it feels like to be hungry. And so it was a really important lesson for me, and that has given me the passion to advocate for the issue, right? Because I, because I know what's at stake. I know what's at stake, and, 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 and therefore it just makes me better at my job. Yeah, and, and how much, because I know your grandmother raised you early on, uh, Gogo, which I, I, I love the name because when I picture you and the trajectory you've made, I think you were like on the Gogo the entire time. So I, I think it's appropriate that you, she was your inspiration. Can you talk a little bit about Gogo and what she meant to you and your relationship? Because it was really something special. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult for me to talk about Gogo without getting emotional because Gogo raised me. You know, my own parents were not able to raise me because of just economic status and so many things that happened to, to their own lives. And so at the age of one, they left me with my Gogo. And in fact, growing up, I thought Gogo was my mother. You know, she called me her dear child and it was just her and I against the, the world, as it were. And in fact, this this picture behind me, I know you can only see partially see it, but this is actually our home in, in Zimbabwe, this small hut where I grew up with my girl go and she was just everything and she she had just such profound wisdom. You know, everything that I am, the core of who I am is is from my girl go. She taught me what it means to be human, she taught me what it means to exist in a world and 
to exercise compassion towards others. And even this idea of pursuing a humanitarian career, yes, there was this moment with this girl in the blue uniform, but really the foundation of realizing this is what I wanted to do was really from my go-go and the wisdom that she taught me about what it means to exist in a world and that we all have to do our part to uplift one another, as was the case in my community growing up. So go-go is my everything. Oh, well, I, I think she would be so proud looking down on you, what you've achieved and, and, and inspired by her. I think it's so beautiful. And when you talk about the, the picture behind you, it reminded me that anybody who wants to see a bigger image, all you have to do is touch the, um, the video and stretch it out with your fingers if you want it bigger or shrink it with your fingers, um, which is one of the, and you can actually touch the image and move it around. So uh, you can play with that and, and get a bigger view of her beautiful smile. Uh, so your book, I love the way it's set up. The chapters are set with, um, preceded by an African proverb which I really love. And one in particularly really resonated, resonated with me personally. It says, we desire to bequeath two things to our children. Yeah. The first is roots. The other one is wings, which is a Sudanese proverb. And I thought that was so beautiful. I, I loved all the proverbs. And I, I just wonder if you can talk a little bit about African proverbs, what they mean to you personally in your life, but also as an African woman um, and why you're sharing those uh, in, in the book. So this is a memoir. So obviously it's a story about me, but Africa is the second big character, you know, alongside Gogo and all this, because I realized, you know, when I got this incredible opportunity and thanks to my publisher and the entire team at Scribner, who gave me the chance to tell my story, you know, a story of a girl out of Africa. And I realized what an honor it was. And then with that realization, immediately I was hit with this responsibility to say, well, if you're going to tell your story, you've got to tell the story in its totality, right? Because I'm only here because of all the incredible sacrifices and the commitments that my entire family, you know, invested in me. But I'm also here because of Africa and, and, and what it means to be African and those values that have guided me from this young girl in a small village, even continue to inform the way that I do my work today. And so I really wanted this book to be a love letter to my African continent. And I saw an opportunity to do two things. One was to be able to celebrate the diversity of the African continent. Uh, and within that, trying to also shift this mis misperception that we often see in mainstream media of seeing Africa as a country and seeing Africa as this dark, troubled continent. And I wanted to be able to take the reader on this beautiful journey, you know, of what Africa is. You know, it is a continent of 55 countries where 1.2 billion people who speak more than 2,000 languages. And so then began actually the exciting opportunity to say, how can I articulate the diversity of the continent? And for me, Proverbs became one very easy way to take the reader down this journey, but also do, do that in such an inspiring and a meaningful way versus just trying to shove Africa down people's throat, but was like, perhaps you could learn something out of the African continent. And so this particular proverb for me resonates profoundly because it, it, it's kind of what my Gogo taught me, right? That I belong on the African continent, but I also belong elsewhere in the world, right? That we, I could leave the African continent, but within that, never forget that the roots of who I am, the best part of where I am is my African heritage and all the values that I learned growing up. And so it, it is continue to shape the way that I see the world. I know most people who come from underprivileged communities sometimes feel like they've got to escape, right? They've got to escape and once they escape, they never want to look back. And for me, it's completely the opposite. It's always being reminded that I have the wings to fly and be elsewhere in the world, but the core of who I am and the roots that ground me is my African heritage. And, and, and that's what's beautiful about this. How are you at such a young age? So inspirational. My God, I could listen to you all night long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'm going to give all the credit to Gogo. -Go. <laughs> no, but, but I think also, actually, Susan, I think there's something to be celebrated about the African cultures. And 
in particular, you know, a very key ancient wisdom that grounds this book is this ancient wisdom of Ubuntu. You know, Ubuntu literally means I am because you are and because you are, you know, we are. And it's really re recognizing this, this interconnectedness between us that, you know, a person is a person through other people. And within this understanding of Ubuntu, there is so much about how, you know, like how do you function once you understand that you are part of a community, you are belong to something that's bigger than yourself. It impacts how we even dream, you know, a dream in the West is for yourself. You dream of what it is, the things that you want to achieve for yourself. In the African context, a dream can be for one, but it can be a ma it can be for many. So you dream a dream for others because you dream a dream that will not only uplift you, but also your community. And so I learned this at the age of six. And that is obviously informed the way that I see the world and and uh, and continue to really see myself as, as part of a greater whole. And even the work that I do, it's really driven by this idea that the only way that I can uplift myself is also by uplifting others. Um, and so, so, so that's, again, I think that's actually a really good uh, emphasis on what we're talking about, that there's so much of the African cultures that we don't often talk about. And, and there's so much power in that, right? I think now we are in a situation, I think the rest of the world is finally realizing and waking up this idea with the pandemic that we're in it together. This is a group project. We are, we succeed as, as one or we fail as one. And it's something that I knew at the age of six that you know we exist in as a collective and not as individuals. Yeah, and, and I find it interesting because when I was reading your story, I was just kind of, I don't know, just taken, I can't even, I don't even have words for it. But, you know, at the age of six, you are like basically running your household while your grandmother's working the fields. And then when you're done with your, your jobs, you go out and help her in the field. And um, it, it's just remarkable. So I see where you get your strength from. Well, yeah. So from the age of five, I became in charge of the goats. My, my grandmother had 11 goats. I don't know if anyone listening here has ever had to take care of goats. They're <laughs> so stubborn. And I would have to get up every morning at five o'clock. I would have to lead them up a small hill and then tie them onto trees so that they wouldn't want to eat our crops. And that was a lot of work. And um, but again, I'm so grateful because there, there was also the sense of accomplishment that I'd done something, that I was contributing something because it was Goga and I and she was busy working in the field and we had to take care of each other. And so so again, I think it's uh, it's really great because I even spend my time talking to young people who want to do this kind of work. And I always tell them that, you know, passion is one thing, but you've got to couple that with hard work. You know, nothing that is worth pursuing is easy. And and I get my work ethics from that young age. And again, so grateful that I went through that. Again, most people would see that as a, oh my God, that was like a really bad time in my life. And I'm so happy to, to be away from it. And in the opposite, I, I feel like that was such an important lesson of what it means to to work hard and to and to contribute something. Yeah, you, you have so many important lessons in this book. I don't even think I could think of them all. There are so many. I, I you know, I always pick a book each season that just has resonated with me so strongly. And I really feel like this is the book. I just, I, everything about it is is so beautiful. I mean, it, it, it's heartbreaking, but it's it's beautiful and it's hopeful. And um, I love that you... And, included Africa as a character in the book, because I, I really did feel your love affair with Africa. And it resonated with me because, you know, I've, I've done the typical tourist visits to Africa, you know, the, the uh, safaris in Kenya and Tanzania and South Africa, and I've gone to Morocco, but I haven't, I don't know that in the touristy thing, you really see and grasp the culture and the people. And I felt like you really conveyed that beautifully. And I know you talked about when you, you moved later to London and you were in the hostel and you were, you were expressing frustration of the world's view of Africa as this, you know, poor war torn country where, you know, everybody's starving and the kids has flies on their faces. And, um, but you painted, you painted a realistic picture, but also a really beautiful picture of, of Africa. Yeah, I would say perhaps that was one of 
the of course there were a few few more sort of key challenges in writing the book and the responsibility that I felt with it and the Africa piece I knew I just had to get it right like if I got anything else right this one had to be right because I also realized that I had taken on a very big challenge to call a book I'm a girl from Africa you've got to then follow up right with with uh, really trying to provide readers with a accurate insight into what Africa is, because at the same time, Africa is not a country. And, and I wanted to be able to, to do that, but it, it did require a lot of thoughtfulness and, and just, again, trying to say the African story with dignity, which is often lacking in the Western media in terms of how they frame my continent. And so, I am so grateful that I got this opportunity and and I that I got to use my memoir as as an entry point for people who don't know the African continent to at least start to understand what it is and what it isn't. Agreed. And I, I hope everyone in the audience has either um read her book or is going to read it. Um, you can get a copy from us, um, our website. If you look at the fortune cookie in the middle of your screen, um, you can get a copy of I Am a Girl from Africa on our website, adventuresbythebook.com. And I really hope you do. Um, whether you get it from us or the library or wherever, um, I, I really encourage you to read it. It's it's a meaningful story and message. So, so you're a little girl, uh, you're starving, you're living with your go-go and this blue angel saves you. And then what happens? Then then your mother comes back into your life. And so can you take it from there and, and talk a little bit about that? So that's a very interesting story because I didn't know my mother at all until I was about 10 years old. And one day she appears again when in the midst of a second drought. So at the age of eight, severe drought happens. The girl in the blue uniform saves my life. We carry on with life. Another drought hits two years later, I'm 10 years old. And suddenly we realize that this time I might not survive. And what I don't know in this moment is that my go-go has finally made contact with my mother, who is her daughter, whom she disowned for various reasons, <laughs> including the fact that I was born and I had been born a sin because my mom had had me out of wedlock. And so there was a lot of taboo and stigma that came with that. And I didn't know her. And in fact, when I found out actually that Gogo was not my mother, you know, which I thought she was, I remember just having this sort of moment of longing. I there was so much also guilt as a child because I, I realized, well, w why did she leave me? Be is it because I'm a sin, because she didn't love me? Because, and I had all these insecurities and all this anxiety of why my mother would just leave me behind and not take me with her if she was going to run away, right? Which is what had happened. And long story short, I don't know her, but I, but I, just, I, I start to long for her in a way that I, I just, I, I couldn't get, get it out of my head. I learned that I had a father. I didn't have a father growing up. It was Gogo and I. And so I didn't quite know what to do with this father person. So I kind of decided to ignore the father part of it. But the mother, I knew I really wanted to see my mother. Anyway, one afternoon, we are inside this hut. Sorry, some hut. We are preparing, you know, food packets because when there's a drought, you become very, very careful and thoughtful about how much food you're eating. So you create this small packet so you don't, you know, you can rush on your food. So Gogo and I were in there, we're creating these this packets and suddenly I hear a voice and I just think it's one of the aunts in the village who's come to visit us. And this woman walks in and it's actually a really beautiful scene how I talk about it in the book because when it's also very hot, when you're in the, when you're in the middle of a, dry, of a drought, it just gets really hot. And so you hide inside this hut, you crack the door open, just enough so that there's a bit of air, but not too much, right? Because otherwise you suffocate with the heat. But anyway, as she walks in, it was just this beautiful moment because there was like a halo of light behind her. She, she comes in and she really looks like an angel to me. And when she sits down, I realize she's brought food and I don't know who she is. She looks familiar, I, but I can't, I can't place it. Long story short, she, she's just taking all this food. And I think to myself, 
Thank you, God. This is another angel, just like the girl in the blue uniform who's brought us food. Turns out she's my mother and she's come to take me away. And in this moment, my, my world falls apart because suddenly I don't want to go with this woman. I don't know who this woman is. And she's not an angel. In fact, she's a dark angel. It's like, like all the oxygen and the light just suffocates me in the in this in this small heart and it is my mother and she drags me out of the heart and I'm screaming and my my life literally falls apart and she takes me to to the city with her where I find out that I have three siblings that I've never met before and then I meet this father Baba in my language person and I don't know what to do with him so that was that story yeah and I, I mean I could feel your heart you know, wrenching from your body when you were taking from your beloved Gogo. I mean, I think I just cried at that, that scene. I, I didn't want you to leave her. <laughs> um, so then you spent some time with your mother and then you're moved away again, this time to an aunt and uncle. And so what, what happened there? Yeah. So, so my mother, and again, it's a remarkable story. And this was another piece that I knew that I had to get right because I've often read books that, you know, paint human beings as one dimensional, like, like human beings are just this one thing and this single narrative. And there's so much complexity to the human, right? And I wanted to be able to also do that story, the same level of justice that you would really be taken on this journey where you are exposed to the flaws of what it means to be human. You're also exposed to my own understanding of the situation at the time. And then you see that progress with time because when you first hear about my parents, I think as a reader, you kind of dismiss them as well. I think there's very little love, especially with my father, there's like very little love. And, and that was also intention. I didn't want to hide away from the soreness of, of the story. But then you then realize that it's a completely different story to what you thought this was about. This, um, and so the story, the long story short is that um, my parents run away. They end up in this shanty town. I don't know for people who don't know what a shanty town is, but it's like this really impoverished community where the heart, the you know, the buildings are built with plastic and cardboard boxes and it's just a really densely populated impoverished community so they end up there and they have three children after me and I've never met them before um and they just live a very very modest life because they never went to school and they can't find jobs and but they are really really hard-working people and they still manage to send their children to school so I finally move in with them and I spend a year with them and I went to school but I think my mother, again, who I love so dearly, realized at some point that my I was quite hungry for education because I had not really gone to school in the village and I was actually really good at it. And she wanted to give me an opportunity to, to go to a better school and have a better education. And she had a sister who was a medical doctor who lived in the city and she ends up sending me there. But also the way that this story happens, it's another tragic moment because I don't get any information at all about what's happening. I, I finally end up, I just end up there and my life is turned upside down again. Um, uh, but again, it was such an important moment for me because that's where I realized just what an incredible opportunity and the sacrifice my parents have made to contribute towards sending me to this really, really great private British school in the country, which literally changed my life. Yeah, I mean, it's and you were talking about dreams earlier about the Western idea of a an individual dream versus the African uh, idea of a, a community dream. And you had a story about that, that you were actually had a, a school assignment where you had to write about a dream. Uh, I thought that was really, really interesting. Yeah, so I had this incredible teacher, she was British, and she had given us an assignment to write about our dream. 
And I wrote The Dream Through the African Lens and she failed me. And I actually thought I did a fantastic job. I was so happy about it. And then I find out that I had not passed and she calls me in and she says, do you know why you didn't pass? And I'm like, no, I don't know why I didn't pass. This is a really, really good dream. And she then explains to me that this is not what she was asking for. You know, I had written a dream that was really about my community and about the things that I wanted to do is a way to uplift my community. And she was looking for the individual dream. Like what was the biggest ambition that you have for yourself? But my uncle who was married to my aunt, my mom's sister, he also then taught me a very important lesson that, you know, these things can coexist. Like it's not either or in no one of these ideas is better than the other. It's just a different way of looking at life. You know, you, you can have a dream for yourself, but you can also, that dream can also be a dream. You know, it can be a dream for others. And I also cherish that education because it's also how I think even now as an adult, I'm able to coexist in these different spaces, you know, I work in the West, but my whole life is in Africa. My whole family is in Africa. And I go back home three times a year, if not more, um, you know, depending on my schedule. So it, again, it's it's such a, sometimes, you know, you, you, you are raised with sort of this one view of the world and you kind of stay in that. But to be able to expand, I think your learning and your understanding of the world was such a pivotal thing for me. And this particular thing about the dream, it opened my eyes to so many things. Well, your uncle's wisdom saved me from really getting angry because I was so angry at your teacher for failing you. I said, look at what she accomplished and she wrote about and you fail her. I just didn't get it. So thank you. Thanks to Uncle Sam for, for calming this reader down. <laughs> so you, you had that, that education that set the, the backdrop for you, but it really was your dream to work for the United Nations. And I, I, I think the story is really, um, can I say funny? Uh, looking back on it, it probably wasn't at the time, but can we say looking back on it, it's funny uh, of how you thought you were going to the UN? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but this is what happens to me. In my 20s, I decide that I've got to go and get this job at the United Nations. This was pre-internet. So I go to my library, I do all the research, and I find that there is a UN office in London. And so I'm determined. I sweet talk my gogo uh who is kind enough to you know sell a few of her goats and cows so that i can buy a ticket to go to london and again mind you i don't know anyone in london i've no family no friends in the uk and one day i landed heathrow airport with 250 pounds to my name and just determined to work for the un I soon realized, literally the day after I land, that actually the UN does not have an office in London. And what I thought was the UN is an organization called the United Nations Association, which I thought was like a similar thing to like UNICEF, which is the UN entity on children, or UNAIDS, which is the UN entity on HIV AIDS. But this was a completely different uh, organization. It's an NGO that was set up independent of the UN to promote the work of the UN. So it's not the UN. And um, just like with, I think sometimes when you're trying to pursue a dream that's bigger than yourself, <laughs> literally everything falls apart. I realize I can't just go back home, like with nothing after all the sacrifices. But then I also realized at some point that I've run out of money. The 250 pounds is gone. I'm living at this point in this really, really filthy youth hostel. I'm about to get homeless. And, you know, there were moments when I just thought perhaps I just need to give up. But then I remember two things. I remember that this was a dream that was for my community. And so I couldn't give up on it, right? I think it was just a dream for myself, Susan. At this point, I would have said, you know what? I gave it my all because I, I, I tried to even look for a job after I realized there was no UN and nobody would hire me because I didn't have a university education, right? So I was completely underqualified. Uh, but then I, you know, this this realization that this was, this was a dream that was bigger than myself. It was a dream for my community and I, I couldn't give up on that. And then also there's some of Gogo's lessons about this resilience that she said that I had in me, that all Africans had in us. Uh, when my mother takes me away, you know, at the age of 10, I'm crying and Gogo takes my hand and she puts it on my, on, on, on my chest and she reminds me that 
you know, she believes that when God created Africans, again, she was trying to cheer up a, a crying child, that he gave us this inner Shinga, S-H-I-N-G-A. Shinga means strength. It means resilience. It's such a very, very powerful word in my, in my language of Shona. And Shinga really in this moment in the UK, when everything was falling apart, became my mantra. Like I sang it, like it was a lullaby that I would go to sleep with and remind myself that I could do this. I could do this, whatever it took. And I did. Well, it's really a testament to your perseverance. I mean, the fact that you ended up in London thinking you're going to end up working for the UN when you realize the UN is actually in New York, but you had no money to get to New York and your your beloved Gogo had you know sold her goats to get you to London. And you know, you're living in this this roach infested hostel, but you are going to make it work. And by God, you do. And I, I just I love the story so much. I just can't say enough about it. So so you're in London, you're trying to make it work, you're trying to make some money so you can you can actually get to the UN one day. Um, how do you actually get there? So first of all, I found a solution. I found a solution. I realized. I'm in this filthy youth hostel. And then one of the guys that I, he would become a really good friend, his name is Val, tells me a really fascinating story. He tells me that this youth hostel has been threatened by health inspectors and they they want to shut them down because the place is really filthy. There's roaches, there's rats everywhere. And one day when the manager's trying to throw me out and I try and beg him for a job to work at the front desk, he says, there's no job. And immediately as he's walking away, I was like, oh, I have a solution for you. I will be the janitor. I will take care of your rush problem so you don't get shut down and we'll do this in exchange for rent. And to my pleasant surprise, he says yes. And so I became a janitor for this place. And it was really, really hard work. But I have to say, though, that it, I took so much pride in doing it because suddenly I realized that I could create this really nice, clean environment for myself. And for the fellow, you know, my, my, my friends would become my friends living in the youth hostel. So I end up actually being able to stay in the UK because of this janitor role. And Val, who was working for uh, a recruitment agency, one day he quits his job and I beg him to take me to see his manager with him. And I end up actually getting uh, a job. So that allows me to stay in the UK. And eventually I enroll myself in school and I went back to the United Nations Association because when I arrived in London, right, realizing there were another UN, I'd even begged them for a job or an internship. And they were like, no, you can't. You have to be in university to become an intern. And it took me a whole, I think, two years and a half to be able to go to university. And I went back and I said, can I be your intern now? And, and they said yes. And of course, I applied and I, I you know, interviewed for it and I, got, and I got the position. And it was while I was there that actually the UN came to London. For me, I felt at the time, I was like, this is, because Gogo <laughs> always says that miracles happen all the time and we have to recognize them for what they are. And Susan, if there was any sign of a miracle, this was it. Just think, just imagine for a second, right? I arrive in the London and I think I'm in the wrong place, right? Because I am in the wrong place. The UN is not there. And I'm working, I'm working so hard so that I can like save money and make it to Geneva or make it to New York where the UN is. And one day I'm sitting in this basement working as an unpaid intern, flipping through the Guardian newspaper. And then I see this amazing post. The United Nations is setting up an office in London. I was like, this is... <laughs> This is for me. So that's what happened. Well, who would not hire you? I mean, this is a girl who talks about with enthusiasm and a smile that I got a job as a janitor killing roaches. You know, <laughs> who would not hire somebody with that incredible attitude? My gosh, you are you are something special, I have to say. Um, so, you know, you, you start working um, for the United Nations, but you, you start out working for... Um, AIDS and HIV is kind of your focus. Uh, and so how did you get involved in that kind of work? This actually was one of the most meaningful work that I did because at the age of 14, I started volunteering at HIV AIDS clinics in my country of Zimbabwe because when I was growing up back then in the 80s, there was such a big, big you know, crisis of HIV AIDS on the African continent in my country 
was one of the countries with the highest prevalence rates. And so my aunt who was a medical doctor, or is still a medical doctor, she led the work on HIV AIDS and she invited me to come and volunteer at the clinics where she was working. So I was really exposed to the issue. I also worked, you know, in communities at the same place where my parents live, these underprivileged communities, working with religious leaders and traditional leaders, trying to engage them to help us communicate the message to their to their communities because they were very distrusting of anything coming out of Africa, right, from the West. And so I've been involved in this work. And so that was a really incredible opportunity for me to start my UN career working on an issue that felt so personal. And I'd lost so many relatives as well to the pandemic, to, to, to the to the HIV epidemic. And so um, it was it was just really, really, really meaningful work. Yeah, and, and I have so many other things I want to ask you and talk to you about, but I also want to remind the audience because I want to give them a chance to chat with you as well. If anybody wants to join us on stage and has a comment for Elizabeth or a question for her, uh, you just click on the little black circle in the lower left corner of your screen, invite yourself up on stage, and uh, you can talk to her live. That's the beauty of this Fireside app. Um, so uh, while while we're waiting for people to join us on stage and ask questions, let's let's move on. So you do all this this work with AIDS and HIV, but then you get more involved, and more entrenched in um, healthcare in general, and in in finding um, ways to get medicine to uh, remote areas that. Uh, are, are having a lot of health issues and, and death and dying because they're not able to get um, get this medicine. So you move from kind of that HIV AIDS work to to this. What can you tell us a little bit about that? So that was a really important part of the, the things that I wanted to accomplish, right? I went into the UN knowing that this was a dream for my community. You know, the the thing that it kept me going, the amount of times when I felt that I should give up was always this desire to do something that would make a difference on the African continent. And so even just starting off with HIV AIDS was such a big win and, and, and a dream come true for me. But then I also realized the more, because also mind you, I'd grown up in Zimbabwe and that's just one small country on the African continent. And my work with UNAIDS on the HIV AIDS work really exposed me to the diversity of the continent. Even as an African, I was starting to discover just how vibrant and diverse our continent was and also how much inequity was across the continent with regards to, to uh, access to healthcare. And I realized that there were so many communities that were completely isolated where they couldn't even access any any service to begin with, but let alone have access to the medicine, life-saving medicine that they needed. And so I took it upon myself to really look for an opportunity within the UN that would allow me to even continue to make a slightly bigger contribution than I'd done with just HIV AIDS. And so I worked at the World Health Organization, uh, which is the, the leading organ on public health and was focused on making sure that, you know, no one ever had to die just from lack of access to healthcare and it took the work really opened up my eyes to so many things, including maternal mortality and how it was impacting the continent, which then inspired me again. I think you see in the book, the trajectory of my career, every decision I've made is always been with the starting question of starting with the why, why am I doing this? And it's, the answer is always finding a way that I can make the greatest contribution. And that allowed me, you know, whatever I learned from this project, I then look at how, with the new knowledge that I have, how can I make more uh, more impact in the world? And that the public health work really informed that. Because then I, I, I go onto the World Bank, as you know, because then I realized there's this whole other area called pharmaceutical policy that needs to be readdressed and, and um, to make sure that people have access to the medicines. Yeah, and then so you do work, work for the World Bank. You move to Geneva for a while. You're you're um, involved in gender equality. I mean, it, it, you're you're so driven. And what what is that driven? It, is that from Go Go? What what drives you? It... That's actually a really profound question because what drives me is gratitude. You know. 
we spoke about the drought when I was eight years old. I was one of the lucky ones, you know? So many kids died in my village and in my country, and I was one of the lucky ones. And I made a pact with God at the time that if he saved my life, I would do something meaningful with it. You know, it was almost like a loan that I was asking for and making a commitment that I was going to pay it back with interest. And I got a much bigger loan than I thought I would ever get. Not only was I saved from this drought, but just my whole life shifted in such a big way. I got some of the, you know, the best education that not even, none of my siblings had the same opportunity that I, that I did. And so it's a responsibility that I take, you know, with such profound, just, just like such, such accountability, um, for lack of a better word. And there's an African saying that to whom so much is given, so much is expected. And I know that so much has been given to me. And, but I do this not out of sort of like this responsibility that I just have to fulfill, but I also do it because I'm driven to make a difference because I believe that it's going to take all of us and that, you know, none of us are ever too small to make a difference. And I see that every time when I do just this one small thing, I am amazed at how much of an impact it creates. And so then it inspires me to do even more because our world just needs more of us taking care of it. Boy, isn't that the truth for sure. Um, Deanna has joined us on stage. Hello, Deanna. Did you have a question or a comment for Elizabeth? Well, I have a comment. Um, Elizabeth, I have to say that you are an inspiration. Uh -huh. It is just incredible hearing this. I will definitely be grabbing the book. Um, I want to say, Susan, <laughs> you are also an inspiration. You bring um, just just incredible authors here. I've only been following you for a little bit here on Fireside. I'm fairly new to Fireside, a new creator here, and I'm just amazed. I love books, um, so I think this is awesome. Um, I have, I'm, I'm probably much later in life than you, <laughs> but I have big, big visions for things that um, need to be done in, a, in an area um, you know, that needs attention. And I think just listening to you with the, with your gifts, your talents and your persistence. Um, but the biggest message, um, and I agree totally is that of gratitude, um, being able to have gratitude and good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter what, um, is, is such a shift in and of itself. And so I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just wanted to say I appreciate it. I just appreciate it. It's, it's incredible. So thanks, thanks for sharing. I love it. Well, that's really, that's really kind. And you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to talk about it at, more at the end of the event, but since you brought it up, you know, you, you talk about um, Elizabeth saying that you know there's so much to be done, and and Deanna, you want you want to help and. We always read stories like this of somebody who have, who have really made a difference in the world, and we think, what can we do as you know, simple humans, <laughs> you know? And that's what I love about this book is at the very end, she has a call to action. She gives you, I don't know how many, because she talks about all these different organizations and what you can do. So you choose one. She's got it broken down into hunger, poverty, education, HIV, AIDS, healthcare, river blindness, maternal mortality. So she breaks it down and then tells you what you can do, where you can go to help. So, you know, the, the story in itself is beautiful, but the fact that she includes that, um, because you you do leave after reading the book that you want to make a difference, you want to help, you want to you want to continue the work that she's doing and help her because she's like a one woman f toward a force. My gosh! So um, thank you for sharing those thoughts, Deanna. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And I'm, like I said, I'll check out the book and definitely check out the back. I have some mission driven stuff of my own, but I am loving being able to contribute so thank you well thank you for your contributions and thanks for joining us and i see that jacqueline has joined us on stage hello jacqueline did you have a hello i'm so happy to have this opportunity 
um, our book club read your book. I'm sorry to say I didn't know about you before. And then our book, one of the women in our book club chose it. And I'm so grateful to her that she did. But I guess the comment I'd like to make is that as a nurse practitioner, I'm going to take a guess that when you were writing this book and you referenced river blindness in sub-Saharan Africa, which is treated with ivermectin, which is a wonder drug for river blindness, that you never would have thought that that particular drug would be the cause of so much divisiveness in the country today. And that people don't understand that it's to treat parasites, that there is no evidence. In fact, a paper was just released earlier this week showing that it has no effect against the virus you know, with COVID, and that so many leading physicians have said, please don't take this drug, it's not safe. And yet people go to feed stores to buy it, you can't get it at feed stores anymore, I've heard, to treat COVID. And I would just like to take this section of your book, like this is what it was meant for, thank God it's available to these people, but dear Lord people, listen to doctors. So that would be my comment. Thank you for sharing that, Jacqueline, especially as a, as a nurse. We appreciate the, the medical uh, side of things. Thank you. Um, so, Elizabeth, you talk, um, you talk a lot about your faith. You talk about concepts like Shinga, which you've already talked about, and Ubuntu, what connects us as human beings, um, the idea that there is no I without we, which I love. But you talk a lot about faith and, um, and God. So how... How in instrumental is that in your life? Where did, did that come from, Gogo? How did you develop your faith and what does that mean to you? So it certainly came from Gogo. I mean, growing up, we went to church every Sunday, right? And I remember also, it actually really became something that sustained us. I think our faith, in fact, when you look across the African continent as a whole, let me just kind of pull back away from my own personal experience. We are a very, very spiritual continent. And I think part of that reason is because we've got to hold on to something. A lot of challenges have, you know, confronted our African communities on the continent. And I think the one way that we kind of keep being able to get up every morning and do it all again and believe that tomorrow will be better than today is, is through faith. You've got to hold on to something. And I remember even as a young child, especially during moments of droughts when there was nothing to eat and Gogo would still say, let's kneel and pray. And as a child, I would ask stupid questions about what are we praying for? You know, like God isn't answering our question. And should, should you say, you know, we pray for the things that we have and the things that we shall have. And really without, without, failure God would deliver it was not always on our timeline but you know something would, would happen and we would all carry on and would find a way to survive and so I've clung on to that um and I think even when I found myself living the African continent on my own having a sense of and it doesn't have to be God right I think the important thing to anyone listening is that just have something that you believe in just something that you can hold on to, uh, especially when life gets really difficult. And for me, it's faith. And it's something that I continuously come back to and lean back on uh, when things are overwhelming and when things feel very challenging, when I can't understand why the world is as broken as it is and why such bad things happen or why Hunger is still the leading cause of death, even though we grow enough food to feed everyone. A child dies every five seconds, and I almost became that child. And so you've got to have something that you hold on to. And for me, my faith is is really key. Yeah, and I, I don't know. It just popped into my mind. It's completely a non sequitur. But you talked about Val earlier, and he was from Ukraine, if I remember correctly. And so I just want to put a message out there to, to Val out there in the universe and to Ukraine that we're you know, we're praying for you right now. It's a really difficult time and uh, we hope it comes to a quick and peaceful resolution. Um, so uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention about your book that I just really got a lot of joy out of is um, your use of certain words in, in double, like nice, nice, plenty, plenty, soon, soon. And I've never heard that before, but I just, I loved it. Could, what, what is that? 
<laughs> so this is actually it's it's a universal way of speaking on the African continent. And again, different countries will express it in different ways, but it's always the same same thing. It's about it's just I think it's in short, it's just the enthusiasm. It shows the African sort of color and flavor in our language when we speak. And so in also writing this book, I think one of the things that I, I wanted to be protective of was to not sanitize the book. I wanted it to have this quirky African way of speaking. And so so that it embraced the Africanness of of the narrative, right? And so, yes. So in, in African languages, actually the majority of the African languages, we use double words to for emphasis, right? So if something is, instead of saying something is amazing, we'll say it's nice, nice. Or you can't just be fine, you've got to be fine, fine. You know, so it's just, it's a very playful way of showing our enthusiasm and vibrancy for life and all the good things. And so, so you will see a lot of that in the book. Well, you, my dear, are a bright, bright ray of sunshine, I have to tell you. So um, I, I, our time is winding down. Um, one last call if anybody has any uh, other questions for Elizabeth. Otherwise, um, what, are, what are you doing now? Are you still working for the UN? What are, what's going on in your life now? Yeah, so I still work for the UN, and I am a special advisor working to address global hunger which again, as I said just earlier on, that it is just really heartbreaking for me to realize that a child dies every five seconds from hunger. And in particular, also when you look at what's happening with climate change, which is disproportionately impacting communities in Africa and in, in you know, low, income, low income countries, Latin America, South America, and yet those communities contribute the least towards climate change. And so part of our education and the thing that I'm very passionate about right now is trying to educate people like us who live in the West, who are contributing the most towards climate change about what our own, our own eating habits, our own, you know, behaviors are impacting communities that we may never meet, but we are causing such a huge crisis around food. And so that's the work really trying to raise awareness of climate change, trying to uh, figure out a way that communities that are really contributing the least towards this issue don't have to pay the biggest price, which is currently the case. So that's that's my work right now. Wow. Well, bless you for what you have done and what you are continue to do. Um, so those of you who um, enjoyed Elizabeth and how could you not, you could click on her, her link, um, her little icon. And anytime she is on fireside and I hope she comes back someday, uh, you'll get notice of that. You can also click on my icon. Anytime we do adventures by the book events, um, you'll get notification of that to join us on fireside anytime. Um, any final thoughts that you want to make before we go, Elizabeth? Yes. So I'm like, my friends always say to me, like, you're such a sales rep for humanitarian work. Like, if, if I see someone, I'm just like, would you like to change the world with me? Anyway, so, so I'm going to make a similar call here that we are living in a world right now that is completely broken with rising inequality. We are seeing major disparities among communities, among countries. The pandemic has made things far worse than they were, you know, almost kind of exacerbating this, this divide. And all this means is that we all have to play our part to be part of creating the change because it's not going to be someone else doing it. It's going to be all of us. And I want to leave you one of my favorite African proverb, which is also in the book, that if you think you're too small to make a difference, try spending a night in a room with a mosquito. <laughs> And it's just such a great reminder that none of us are too small to make a difference. And I'm only here because one girl in an African village gave me a bottle of porridge and saved my life. And I think sometimes we feel ourselves quite overwhelmed. We don't know where to start. We think that we have to do everything, but it doesn't have to be complicated. All it requires is that you take, around, take a look around your own community and just do one thing to uplift even just one person. You could be, you know, it could be the next Elizabeth. It could be someone like me who needs support right now. And so I just, again, wanted to issue that reminder. And there's so many easy ways that you can be part of creating change. 
There are food banks that you can donate to. You, you can volunteer there, but you just got to do something. I think that's the biggest ask here. You have to do something. Don't turn away when you see a homeless person walking towards you. Very small actions will make the biggest difference. And I think collectively, if we all individually create one small action, I think those can accumulate into big change. Um, and, and we need that. We need big change in our world right now. We need to heal and we need to find a way to exercise compassion towards one another to, and maybe perhaps Ubuntu could be that solution that are not, uh, enables us to see the humanity in each other and stop the divide. Well said. And I just want to add on to that, that um, what she talked about is, is one person. It was one person who brought her a pole, bowl of porridge that saved her life. That one little action that anybody can do, anybody can take that one little action and had that one person not touched Elizabeth's life when she was eight years old, this tour de force would not be with us today and all these changes made in the world from one little bowl of porridge, one kind act. So you can all do that too. You get her book, go to her call to action at the end. I am a girl from Africa and I, I think it will change your life. It's very inspirational. It's motivational. It's uplifting. It's heartbreaking. Yes. Um, but I, I think of Gogo as I'm looking at your face and I didn't know her. I feel like I know her through your book, um, but she, she is here in all of us. I, I feel that. And so I thank you for bringing your joy and sunshine to the world and to us tonight. And thanks to our audience for joining us as always. Our next adventure by the book event on Fireside is going to be next Thursday night. We continue our conversations in race with Emmy award-winning TV director, and author Jeffrey Blunt, um, we're taking five weeks to talk about different characters in the book and their perspectives on race and just hope it opens up a conversation that, that's much needed in this country about race. So thank you all for joining us. Until next time, what is your next adventure by the book going to be? Thank you again, Elizabeth. Thank you, Abigail, for setting this up. And thank you, audience. Thank you, Scott. And come see us in San Diego, Elizabeth. I will. All right. <laughs> Bye.